doing that. There you go. If you look at the top. Today we're looking for cyanobacteria. I'm trying to really get a sense of the community of plankton. Okay. And that includes zooplankton, cyanobacteria, and regular algae. So even a regular algae, green algae that's edible by, plant, by the fish, could be making this cloudy or sediment if it had been a heavy rain or runoff. You could, there are a lot of things that can cause turbidity, but cyanobacteria is high on that list too. Okay. This is more a biological approach. Chem you know, there is chemistry obviously involved, but we're looking at the biology and the ecosystem, which it sort of gives us a different kind of point of view. Because if certain things are there, you know that the system's working in different ways. Whereas if just looking for a chemical, it's a more kind of concrete thing. We could have a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen in here and not have a bloom. But what I'm looking for is actually why are they blooming and who is in that community? So it's a, a different point of view. Okay. A biological approach. But it seems this year, particularly after all our heavy rains, we're seeing a lot of impact from stormwater. What happens is I think it's a big kick of nutrients and chemicals from the environment off impervious surfaces that gives the creatures in the pond uh, a little extra. And particularly the ones that are very adaptable, like cyanobacteria, it gives them a feast. And so they bloom. And that's what we're having a lot of trouble with um, in terms of water quality and recreation this June and July. It's, it seems like a hot spot because um, after heavy rain, all the nutrients are right here and it seems to be a place where I do find cyanobacteria pretty commonly. Um, I think just because it's that kick. Um, cyanobacteria loves phosphorus and nitrogen. It seems to get advantages from other chemicals that are human made, pesticides, herbicides. It seems to survive those better than regular edible green algae. So it's just a place where I think that it's a good habitat for cyanobacteria, unfortunately. And it's that kick, a little kick of extra food. It's like anybody, you're, you get a little more energy and you've got a little more life and you can make more cells. So it's, it's the reason why it's bad is because they're, they're getting what they need. Well, there is climate change and everything's warming up and we're getting more dramatic weather. I think that certainly isn't gonna help our cyanobacteria situation. So that's the big picture. The other picture is with all the heavy rains, you have a lot of erosion, so that destroys maybe things that were protecting the pond before, or the water levels have been really high too, and so the shoreline's eroding and there's less protection to begin with. So it's many factors coming into play. Um, I really think the torrential rains, though, it, the, the grooving out and, and carrying with them sediment, even sediment alone can be very bad for a pond. So just for regular creatures, in addition, it brings more nutrients, of course. Pets and wildlife are, are, are the first tier of this and they're impacted very more dramatically because they're smaller, usually not all dogs, of course, but any animal that's consuming the water or living in the water is directly exposed. Dogs, in terms of people type of, or our domestic creatures, um, are most at risk because they drink pond water um, and large quantities and maybe on regular basis. They go out in the morning, they go out in the afternoon. So their exposure to toxins is that much higher. Also, they swim and they lick their fur. Lots of dogs, long-haired dogs can definitely carry a lot of stuff with them, including the scum. The scum attaches to their fur. So the exposure for smaller creatures, dogs in particular, is a really big concern and maybe partly why a lot of these notifications haven't gone out in the past. It wasn't a human health issue, but it's definitely part of the spectrum and it's a, it's a clue as to what's coming in, in the future for all of us. Kind of Boeing. So. Yeah. Anyway, so not a good photo, but... <laughs> I, I'll, but the, there's cyanobacteria in here, which is toxic, so don't drink it. Yeah. If you okay. catch <laughs> catch fish, do you catch a release? Or? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, then you're fine. It's, it's sometimes particularly in the organs, like the liver or the... the Did salt. you see anything in there? Yes, it's hard to see right now. You can see a little bit of them. The, what, the little tiny little flecks, see them that glisten green? I do see them. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. the side bacteria. What, what is it? What, it's, is that bacteria? Yep, it's not really infectious or problematic. That way it's just when it decays, it makes toxins. And this particular species, it's called microcystis, makes, it's pretty much a guarantee that it'll do it, make toxins, that is. So, um, affects dogs. Particularly, yeah, so, because they oh, drink it. What about the fish? It can harm fish. We're just doing new research on that, how it enters the food chain and at what, what level they get yeah. harmed. Yeah. If there's a bad bloom, they can lose oxygen and just die from anoxia because it can overtake the pond. And how long will that last? Uh, right now, we're probably in week two of this, and sometimes it just goes up and down. They have a life cycle. We get a really bad one usually in August or the fall. Yeah. So it, unfortunately, they're kind of these wave-like patterns. So 
this one looks like it get, it's getting better from last week, to be honest, but I, I can't really tell until I look, go back to, and Excellent. look under the microscope. Wow. When you're talking about public health, the expediency of what you have here is really what it's, it's all about, right? <laughs> yeah, to me, so you yeah. you want to be able to get that information, at yeah. least initially, right. uh, back out to the public, and the fastest and most efficient way to do that is to come back here with the samples. Yeah, and be right where I can send the information out, yep, on okay. the computer. But I use the microscope to identify the species. I'll show you, we use a gridded slide, that's the coolest part of this. More than 70,000 cells, then I would close a beach. Not so much yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, lots of that. This is just from the, you know, I didn't do any filtering. That's today. Yeah. Remember you saw them, we're like, oh yeah, I see those little flecks. That's what they're, they're colonies. Oh boys, uh, but um, a lot of the colon the dense colonies. Yeah, what makes me nervous is that these can number one double. Okay. <laughs> and that's the other thing I calculate. I do the fluorometry from last week to this week and figure out how much change there is. Because if it's really changing quickly, then the bloom is coming even more. But I think we're already getting close to that. But we have an alert list so people can get direct emails from the health division. That's one strategy. We have it posted on the web page, and there's a new Sino map through the APCC, the Association to Preserve Cape Cod, where you can click on different ponds all over the Cape to see if they've been tested and or what their status is. So that's a very helpful tool if you're not just staying in Barnstable. But um, also look at beaches, the beaches, any public beach or permitted beach, which could be an association beach, will be per posted if there's any problem. Do a lot of ponds in Barnstable, there are 182. We can't do all of them and some of them are not really relevant to do. So we have like a top tier of 13 ponds and a total of probably 40 that we do look at. The top tier gets weekly monitoring for sure, no question. The second tier gets bi-weekly. If, if they have a problem, we bump them up to weekly and so forth and so on. So there's some ponds we only get to monthly. And if there's no problem, we leave them at the monthly level. Otherwise, you kind of move up this cha chain of command, as it were, or a triage chain. And it's a way of, with small resources to try to solve a big problem.